What's going on guys, my name is Matt and for the past 5 years I've used exclusively AMD based systems. Back in 2017 I was able to get my hands on a Ryzen 7 1700 and after seeing the performance firsthand, I never looked back. I made a few upgrades along the way to newer AMD CPUs and never really considered switching to an Intel based system, but that all changed recently. With Intel's release of their 12th gen CPUs, I now finally have a reason to make the jump and try out an Intel based system for my personal rig. The PC I have now works fairly well, but because my most limited resource at the moment is time, a little improvement in my workflow can really add up and be beneficial. Because of all this, I decided to build a new system from scratch to try out a 12th gen based CPU and see what all the hype is about. Now before I show you that PC and how it performs, I want to show you what kind of systems I've been working with for the past 5 years and take a minute to talk about today's sponsor Micro Center who is the reason this video is possible. If you don't know, Micro Center is in my opinion the best place to buy PC parts in store and has been referred to by many as quote unquote tech heaven. They have an insane selection of PC parts along with tons of other tech and what's even more insane is the deals you can find there. As an example of this, you can get an additional $25 off of any AMD or Intel processor by grabbing the coupon in the description and heading in store. One of my favorite things Micro Center offers is their PC builder tool that allows you to part out a system with components that are in stock and ready to be purchased. Micro Center also has a build showcase area where you can show off your build or get inspiration for your next system. And right now, if you submit your build to the build showcase, upon approval you'll receive a coupon to use on your next Micro Center in-store purchase. To find a Micro Center near you or check out any of the things I mentioned, then head to the links in the description and thanks again to Micro Center for making this video possible. Getting back into the video, before we talk about my new build, I want to give you an idea of where I'm coming from. My first Ryzen build was fully completed towards the end of 2017 in the form of an ITX build containing a Ryzen 7 1700, 16GB of RAM, and a GTX 1070 Ti. This was the most high-end PC I had ever used and at the time it was a dream come true to be able to have such a powerful system. A few years later I made a minor upgrade spec-wise to a Ryzen 7 2700 base system with 32 gigs of RAM and an RTX 2060. And the final stop on my Ryzen journey is the system you're looking at right now and the one I've been using for the past year or so. This system has a Ryzen 9 3900X, 64 gigabytes of memory, and an RTX 2070 Super. It's a powerful system and overall works pretty well. I was even using it in my custom wooden case for a while but needed more room for expansion so it now lives in this very boring but functional thermal take case. So why am I even upgrading? Well like I said before, time is money and if a system upgrade can even save me an hour or two of time a week, it's well worth it. Beyond this, I'm just morbidly curious as to what the experience of using a modern 12th gen CPU is for someone like myself. Now my PC needs to be a jack of all trades, I game, work, edit, and do tons of other things with my PC so having a fast and powerful system is a must. Also, with the exception of my first Ryzen build, all of my upgrades between then and now have been to last gen parts as those were more affordable and I could justify having them in my system knowing I wouldn't need them for videos. So what parts are going into my new system? Well let's start by talking about the CPU. This PC is based around Intel's flagship Core i9-12900K. The CPU is probably the best jack of all trade CPU on the market. AMD's new 5800X 3D does outperform it slightly in gaming, but I do much more than just gaming on my PC. With 16 cores and 24 threads, the 12900K is offering an insane amount of multi-threaded performance. This combined with turbo speeds of over 5GHz and the impressive IPC of the Intel 7 lithography, it means any workload I throw at this Thing is going to be performed with ease. Now I should note, 8 of these cores are what Intel refers to as efficiency cores which do run at a lower speed and don't have hyper threading, but they still give a good performance uplift in many applications. This performance is great but it comes at a cost, and that cost is in the form of thermal output. This little chip puts out a ton of heat and draws a lot of power. This means I need a beefy cooler, a motherboard with adequate VRMs, and a larger power supply than most systems. To cool this CPU, I 
originally was going to go with a 280 millimeter Corsair cooler I had on hand, that is until I went to build my PC and realized I didn't have the necessary mounting hardware for 12th gen CPUs. Getting an adapter kit would have likely taken a few weeks which wasn't an option, so what I did was find the cheapest 240 millimeter AIO I could on Amazon with Prime Delivery, selected the white version, and had it arrive on my doorstep a day or two later. This is the ID Cooling RFlow X240, it's about $70, it's pretty highly rated, has RGB, and comes with LGA 1700 compatibility out of the box. What I didn't realize until I got it was that only the black version has support for 12th gen out of the box. This the Snow Edition does not. Luckily, I could order an adapter kit for this one for about $10 with Prime Shipping that showed up about a day later. This is a 240mm AIO liquid cooler that includes two RGB fans, and I will tell you straight up, this thing is not equipped to handle this 12900K under a full load. It technically works fine, but I will be discussing temps later in the video. Along with the release of 12th gen Intel CPUs also came the introduction of DDR5 memory onto a mainstream platform. This is good as it means we now have access to the latest, greatest, and fastest memory available. The one big downside is the price. DDR5 is still outrageously expensive, luckily though 12th gen CPUs still work with DDR4 memory, and the performance difference honestly isn't that huge. So when picking out a motherboard, I knew I wanted a DDR4 board as I already had memory from my old build I wanted to use in this one, and there was no way I was going to shell out four to $500 for 64GB of RAM. After some deliberation, I decided to go for the Gigabyte Z690 Aero G. This board costs about 260 bucks and seemed like the perfect fit for this build. It has four DIMM slots, plenty of PCI expansion, and four M.2 slots. Yes, you heard that right, four M.2 slots. The VRM setup is adequate for my 12900K, and one of the biggest selling points for me was the back panel I.O. As a content creator, I need a lot of USB ports, and the 10 this board is offering is perfect. This along with other nice features like built-in Wi-Fi and 2.5 gigabit LAN means I should have plenty of room to plug everything I need in. Is this board perfect? No, but I think for the price and for the features it offers, it was the perfect fit for my build. Now let's talk about memory. I still needed my current PC until I fully switch over, so for now I'm throwing in a 2x16 GB kit of Corsair Vengeance LPX RAM. This is DDR4 memory running at 3600MHz CL18. It's nothing fancy, but will get the job done for testing and until I'm able to fully transfer over to this system. For those that are curious, I will eventually be moving my four 16 16GB sticks of Team Dark Alpha RAM over, which will give me 64GB of memory running at 3600MHz. 64GB is probably a bit more than I really need, but again, time is money and having more memory can speed up my workflow in programs like Premiere Pro. Now let's talk about storage. In the system I'm switching over from, I have three SSDs, a one terabyte drive for my OS, a 500 gigabyte one for an editing scratch disk, and another one terabyte for holding stuff like games and gameplay recordings. In my new system, I'm only going to be starting out with two. My main SSD is going to be this two terabyte WD Black SN770. This drive will hold my OS, applications, games, and gameplay recordings. I haven't decided on what my second SSD will be, but I've decided I will be upgrading to a one terabyte one to hold all my current project files, which will replace my 500 gigabyte scratch disk. One thing also to keep in mind is I have a storage server that holds all of my old projects, and I recently made a video about that storage server that I'll link in the description below. So now it's time to talk about the graphics card that's going into this system. I own a number of current gen cards, including a 3080 that I could throw in here, but I honestly don't need that much GPU horsepower. Building an overkill system is awesome, but I would rather save the current gen stuff to use in videos, and again, I don't think I could truly utilize the power that a 3080 offers. Because of all this, I decided to make a minor step up for my current 2070 Super and go for a 2080 Super. Sure, the 2080 Super isn't current gen, but it's still very powerful and has 8 gigabytes of video memory, which is enough for my needs. I may upgrade in the future when NVIDIA 4000 releases, but for now, this 2080 Super should work great. This is normally where I'd talk about the power supply, but the case actually influenced my power supply selection, so I'll talk about that first. 
The case I decided to go with is the Lee & Lee 011 Dynamic Mini in white. I built in this case back in 2021 and absolutely fell in love with it. It isn't a new case anymore, but I still think the design is incredible and knew from the get-go that this was going to house my new personal rig. This is a very modular case that can support up to an ATX motherboard, a bunch of radiators, multiple 3.5 inch drives, and its dual chamber design gives it a shorter, more compact appearance. The one big downside with this case is that it only supports SFX power supplies. The Air version of this case supports full-size ATX units, but this one does not. The reason this is a downside is SFX power supplies are generally more expensive than their full-size counterparts and are hard to find with large power outputs. I looked at a bunch of options and eventually decided on going for this Cooler Master V850. This is again an SFX unit with 850 watts of power output and an 80 plus gold efficiency rating. At around 150 50 bucks, it's not cheap, but it's high quality, reliable, and it's still kind of mind blowing to me that they're able to fit 850 watts of power in such a small package. I mean, just look at it next to this EVGA 850 watt unit. So those are the core components, but there are a few extras I want to talk about. The first is that I got these white Asia Horse cable extensions, which for like 25 bucks cleans up the looks of this system a lot. Finally, for fans, I went with six Corsair QL120 RGB fans. Three is intake and three is exhaust. I use these because I had them on hand. They're great fans, but are ridiculously expensive. I'm just running them as static white. If I needed to buy fans for the build, I probably would have just went for a couple cheap RGB fan packs off of Amazon for a fraction of the price. Also, the radiator is mounted in the second chamber and receives good airflow through the back panel. Like I alluded to earlier, I need to switch something up cooling wise so this will not be the final configuration. So how much did it cost? Well, I used parts provided from Micro Center and others I had on hands from past projects, but you could build this exact system swapping out the expensive Corsair fans for more generic ones and be all in for a bit under two grand. So the system is in no way cheap, but it's also not the most high-end system in the world either. With that being said, having a PC like this is a dream come true and I feel incredibly grateful that this will be my personal rig moving forward. So now let's move on to benchmarks. Normally for builds, I would run a bunch of built-in benchmarks benchmarks, but for this video, I want to do something a little bit different. I first want to do some quick head-to-head -head workstation benchmarks of my old system versus my new one. Then I'll live benchmark some games that I've been playing lately on my new personal rig to see how it performs in games that I actually play. Then finally, I'll show and talk about temps. For the workstation benchmarks, the first I tried out was Cinebench. Running this on both systems saw a massive performance difference between the two, with the 12900K being more than 50% faster in both the multi-threaded and single-threaded tests. This was kind of crazy to me. I knew there would be a significant performance uplift, but never thought it would be this high. Next, I ran the Blender benchmark on both the CPU and GPU for both systems. Again, the 12900K outperformed the 3900X by a very large margin, which was to be expected. Looking at the GPUs on the other hand, the 2080 Super just barely beat out the 2070 Super. This isn't a big deal to me, as again, most of my workflow does not require the latest and greatest GPU. Finally, I tested 7-Zip, and in this test, the 3900X actually slightly outperformed the 12900K, which was pretty interesting, and while this type of application isn't very relevant to me and my workflow, it does show that the new 12th gen parts still aren't beating out AMD in all areas. So now let's get into gaming benchmarks. Again, I'm going to be testing the games I play on a regular basis. So the first game I'm actually going to be testing is Minecraft. Believe it or not, for the past couple months, I have been on a big Minecraft kick. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump into the vanilla Minecraft server that I've been playing on. Unfortunately, the last time I was on this server, I actually died to the warden. So I need to grab an elytra and some rockets so that we can fly around and see how performance is. So just for reference, in terms of settings right now, I actually have the render distance turned all the way up, which I don't normally play at. I'm at 1440p resolution, fabulous graphics. At these settings, my old system would stay well below 60 FPS. So if I could get a solid 60 FPS with full render distance or 144 FPS with slightly lower render distance, then I'm going to be very happy. So off and away we go. So looking at performance while flying around, we're staying around the 50 to 60 FPS mark, which is pretty good for full render distance. I'm going to turn the render distance down a bit to something that I would normally play at, which would be around, say, 20 chunk render distance, which is much more realistic and is going to give us much better performance. 
Now flying around, we are getting much better performance in the mid to upper 100s a lot. Now it's dipping down to the low 100s. So it seems like performance is going to be perfectly fine for me. This is actually definitely better performance, noticeably better than my old system. So maybe I can even try out stuff like shaders and other mods and stuff like that. So yeah, Minecraft runs perfectly fine on this system. And again, this is considerably better performance than I was getting with my old one. So the next game we're going to look at is a game called Risk of Rain 2. It is a roguelike third person shooter that I've been playing a lot over the past couple months with friends. Looking at the settings, what I did was I set the FPS limit to unlimited and I just left the graphics alone to what it defaulted me to. And I'm going to jump into a game and see what kind of performance I'm getting. Alright, so we are in game and again this is at 1440p resolution and right off the bat performance is looking really good with the FPS staying around the low 200s mark. Definitely towards the later rounds when there are way more mobs, performance is going to drop a bit but again performance looks very very good right off the bat. This is definitely more FPS than I was getting with my old system and is definitely more than enough for this game. Again, this is Risk of Rain 2. If you haven't played it, I would highly recommend it. It's fun to play alone, but especially fun when you play it with friends. So the third and last game that I'm going to test is actually the newest game that I've purchased, which is Black Ops 3 Zombie Chronicles Edition, which is only $20 right now on Steam Summer Sale. Normally, the old Call of Duty games are never discounted, so if you're interested in getting some of those old games, I would recommend doing it now. The reason I purchased this and some of my friends purchased it was for zombies. With the Zombie Chronicles edition, you get a ton of the old maps remastered. Unfortunately, it does use the newer Black Ops 3 guns, but it's still super fun and very nostalgic for myself. So in terms of settings, right now I have it running at 1440p resolution. I maxed out the frame rate to see what we can get. Going into advanced, I have basically everything that it defaulted me to, which seems to be a mixture of high and medium, which is fine for me. So I am now loaded into a game on the Ascension map, which was one of my favorites growing up. As you can see, performance is definitely strong out of the gate. We're looking in the high 100s. I'd imagine when there are tons of zombies and in bigger parts of the map, the FPS is going to be a bit lower. But again, right off the bat, performance is looking really good. Again, this is my most recent purchase. I just got it yesterday and it is definitely a big nostalgia bomb because I have not played zombies on this map in many, many years. So heading to an outdoor part of the map, we definitely are getting slightly lower performance. Actually, it's pretty similar, still around the 144 or higher FPS mark, which is perfect because I play on a 1440p 144Hz monitor normally. So yeah, as you can see, Zombies runs perfectly fine on this system at 1440p high settings with 144 FPS. Also, as you can see, I don't really play too many demanding games, so like I said earlier in the video, the RTX 2080 Super is more than enough performance-wise for me. I am definitely always looking for new games to try out, so if you guys have any recommendations on stuff I should pick up during the Steam Summer Sale, or that other viewers should pick up on this Steam Summer Sale, then leave your suggestions in the comments below. So as you can see, this system performs more than adequate in all the games I'm currently playing, and again, I can always upgrade my GPU in the future if need be. Finally, let's talk about temps. When I put the CPU and GPU under a full synthetic load, the CPU shot up to 100 degrees C, and the GPU stayed in the mid to upper 70s. Obviously, 100 Celsius is not acceptable. This is a somewhat unrealistic scenario, but I do think I'll switch up my cooler in the near future, possibly even to something like a Noctua Tower cooler. If you guys have recommendations for what you think I should use, let me know in the comments below. So all in all, I am super happy with my new build and can't wait to start gaming, editing, and just using it as my day-to-day -day system and seeing what using a 12th gen system is really like. Again, if you guys would have went with different parts, let me know what you would have went with. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.